A warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to today's uh, panel, uh, virtual panel debate on the Critical Raw Materials Act and catching Europe up in the global race. My name's uh, Chris Heron. I'll be your moderator for the next two hours. In my day job, I'm Communication and Public Affairs Director at Eurometo, Europe's Metals Association. Thanks to uh, Mari Pekarinen and Hildegard Bentler, the two MEPs who are hosting our debate today. Before we dive into the context and the details of the discussion, just to step back and look at what brings us together this afternoon. We could change the slide. How can Europe stop falling behind China and now the US in this global race, not just for clean energy supply chains, but also the metals and minerals supply? This is uh, visible in the headlines to, uh, this week in Brussels. Uh, and what we've seen is firstly, China in the last 15 years has dedicated huge amounts of state support to building up a complete position of dominance in the metal supply chains required for our energy transition. And in the recent months, the US has taken a huge step forward to try and itself compete in this race with a $379 billion subsidy package for clean energy supply chains. For Europe, a question mark. Uh, we're still evaluating how Europe will be responding uh, to these uh, competitive measures. But just this weekend, we had a very strong statement from the European Commission President, Ursula von der Leyen, that the new assertive industrial policy of our competitors requires a structural answer. Discussions on subsidies, uh, on state aid and other measures to bring Europe up in this race. Into that wider discussion comes the European Union's Critical Raw Materials Act, a flagship piece of legislation due to be issued by the European Commission at the end of March next year. The public consultation uh, closed two weeks ago for that legislation, receiving already 570 consultation responses. Reading through all of that, there's one area of consensus across all stakeholders, which is the urgency of the challenge and the need for Europe to take some decisive action as soon as possible uh, to make sure it has the metals and minerals it requires for its clean energy industrial plans. Within that, also some divergent concerns. Concerns related to local investment. How can Europe ensure that it delivers new projects for mining, refining and recycling in a content, continent where no new mine has opened in the last 15 years and the refining capacity we have is struggling with the energy crisis? Two, geopolitics. To what extent will Europe turn its back on its principles of free trade? And what does that mean for a supply chains which are so globally integrated? And three, sustainability. How can we deliver these metals and minerals with the minimum environmental social footprint and with an eye on a deeper circular economy? We'd like to tackle some of these concerns and questions in the next two hours. How we're going to tackle them, four stages. Stage one, we'll hear some brief opening remarks from our two host MEPs giving their expectations for the debate ahead. Stage two, we'll be interviewing Peter Handley, head of units at the European Commission, DG Grow, uh, who's spearheading the work on the Raw Materials, crit Critical Raw Materials Act, and he'll be setting the scene on what's ahead. Stage three, we have a brilliant panel debate with four speakers to join, uh, join Peter, debate some concrete steps for where Europe can take action to catch up in this global materials race. That debate will be, be fueled by your questions in the audience, and I'll come on to the details of that in a second. Stage four, we'll go back to our host MEPs to wrap things up and give their reflections on what's needed next. So with that context outlined, I'd like to turn to our two MEPs, to Hildegard, to Maori. Thanks to both of you for hosting this discussion. It's already a very powerful signal that we have two influential MEPs in two different political groups bringing together this issue at an early stage. So we're gonna bring Hildegard onto the screen first to give her remarks. Hildegard, as many of you know, was the Rapporteur for the European Parliament's 2021 report on critical raw materials, and I'm sure will be a decisive figure as we take this discussion forward too. So Hildegard, thank you, and you'll be coming on the screen. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Yes, okay. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much for this introduction and a warm welcome to all of you who joined our webinar. Um, I, I'm very glad that we can uh, continue uh, our issue. Uh, Maori and I are dealing with 
uh, in the parliament at least for two years, and we have not stopped con dealing with it because uh, the uh, our report was not the end of the story. Uh, and I think Mari and Abby were very delighted when Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union speech in September announced a legislative proposal, uh, which really uh, makes the whole thing very concrete uh, and, and the very fundamental basis of our industry politic, uh, industry, in the industry policy. So I'm looking very much forward to this as a member of the industry, of the environment committee, as well as as a member of the De uh, development committee. Um, and of course, we have tackled in the past on many panels, uh, a lot of uh, issues, which we will be tackling also now. But I think it is really, as you said, Chris, a decisive phase because the public consultation has ended. So stakeholders have made up their mind and it's now very with uh, a lot of um, curiosity and excitement we are waiting for the commission proposal. But I think it's, it's also good for us, for Mari and me, to really wrap up our positions and our priorities and our input, we are ready to give uh, once uh, the commission proposal uh, is on the table and will be dealt with also in the parliamentary procedure. So I think everybody is uh, up to the task, but there's always some aspect uh, you can deepen on. And then this is why I'm glad that we also have representatives of Irma here, that we have representatives of a, a very um, innovative lithium project uh, of Germany here, uh, but also uh, uh, other stakeholders uh, known to know, known to you, not yet known to you, and which might be also introduced uh, by Maury to you, uh, colleagues from Scandinavia, which are very, uh, very much advanced uh, in these issues. And I think it's very worthwhile to have this cooperation between me and Maury, as you said, between different regions uh, of Europe, but also between different parties. But we had a very good cooperation, very good understanding in this what we wanted to show also with this webinar we are going to start right now. So much from my side. Many thanks, Hildegard. Uh, clear message for uh, the debate we have, the urgency of having it and, and broadening this perspective with all of the stakeholders we have. Mari, uh, we'll bring you on screen now. Uh, Shadow Rapporteur from the Renew Group on the same report that Hildegard was, was leading. So you know very well the debates as well, and, and, and the partnership is clear. What would you like to say to open our discussion? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Hildegard, also. And uh, I'm very happy to that we have succeeded to organize this, uh, this event. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome to, the, to this webinar also on my behalf to Putin's brutal war was weakened uh, the whole world's geopolitical situation, among many other issues, risk of uh, to raw material supply chains have grown. At worst, they threatened EU's two great and necessary reforms, the green and digital transition. Even worse, first, the trade political confrontations between the great economic areas has escalated as we very well know this is a challenge to our own union union and its autonomy it needs to be reinforced improving our access to the critical raw materials we need is in a key role we need a major reform we need to be able to take responsibility for our own raw material supply we all know that China has an outside role in the global markets for metals. The same goes when we look at the third critical um, materials for Europe. Until now, Europe has put the responsibility on others, so to say, for the production of the raw materials it's needed. At the same time, the US has closed its eyes to securing uh, the environmental uh, performance of imp important uh, raw materials by referring to WTO rules. Rules which China and the US are no longer abiding by. For example, during the last 10 years, China has put a lot of efforts into developing its skills in refining and technologies. Extracted raw materials are exported to Asia and China, especially for refining. Europe's dependency takes many forms. Development of the circular economy is often spoken of on, in uh, connection with critical raw materials, even 
as uh, I understand in the Commission's upcoming proposal. Recycling does offer an important and important, yes, part solution to the supply challenges of critical raw materials. However, they, there is always a delay in getting significant amount of materials from recycling. This is because the original products need to be at the end of the life cycle. We should use both carrots and sticks to develop it further. For example, the, the effective use of industrial side streams uh, would offer possibilities to recover discarded critical raw materials and rare earth uh, elements alongside other technical materials and metals. We should encourage the documentation, assessment and recovery of these valuable materials always where possible. Our strategic autonomy Development cannot solely be based on recycling alone. It is very important, I think so. We cannot count too much on the good function of supply chain either. We should also recall that, that not all sources of supply fulfill the environmental or ethic standards we would like to see in the EU. EU should put much more effort than it does now in increasing mining activities that uh, take place within its borders. There are opportunities in different parts of Europe, I, I, I know, and we all know, by using the newest technologies we can, and we should act in a way that is sustainable both for the environment and, and, and uh, the people. And then also, the search of mineral needs to be based on openness, transparency, consulting locals and on fast and flexible permitting processes. Permitting conditions need to be in place sustainable requirements both for mining activity and the restoration after mining activities. Innovative bioeconomy provides opportunities to improve EU raw material resilience. For instance, in the future, we may be able to manufacture forest industries residues into raw materials for the battery industry. At the same time, we would be able to replace non-renewables with renewables alternatives. Like the title of this webinar states, Europe needs to catch up with others in the global race for responsible acquisition of metals and minerals. I wish uh, everyone a great webinar and look forward to hearing our expert speakers. Thank you so much and welcome. Uh, thank you, Mari. A clear message, a clear opening. You've really put the con uh, focus on the conditions needed to drive local supply chain investment forwards but also you've talked about measures to add to that with other sources whether it's mining waste whether it's circular economy the bioeconomy or more i think this sets us up well uh, for the discussion that will follow before we bring peter online and peter at the moment i think is having his own race uh, through the european parliament from one event to the next i just want to stress that we uh, uh, we want your input from the start in this debate so you're all here on the Zoom platform. Hopefully it's straightforward, but please type your questions directly into the Q&A section of uh, the desk. When we come to the panel discussion, uh, we'll be going through initial interventions, but then your input will structure the second part of that discussion. We also want to start off with a quick poll to check where the audience stands on the Critical Raw Materials Act and its different priorities. So. We'll start with a poll question so our speakers know your views. This should be quite straightforward. Once I've gone through the question and the answers, the poll question will pop up on your screen. I'll then give you about 20 seconds uh, to provide your responses, and then we'll look at the results. Let's look at the question. So if we go to the next slide. Oh, 
so the question which the so to answer the question uh, which has come up on the screen uh, the critical raw material act has a number of pillars outlined in the commission's consultation for achieving the eu's goals we'd like to just get your input of which of those has the highest importance to delivering some of the change that hildegard and mary spoke about so pillar one is to define the priority materials that the act should focus on and then set the eu's objectives for where it wants to be in 2030. Pillar two, improve the EU's monitoring, risk management and governance uh, activities. Pillar three, to strengthen the EU critical slash strategic raw materials value chain. Pillar four, to ensure a sustainable level playing field across the single market. And pillar five, to strengthen the EU external actions, which is more on the long legislative side. But I'll give you 20 seconds to give your view of which of these pillars will be the most important priority for the Commission to take action on, starting now. Okay, we'll close that poll in five, four, three, two, one. Let's take a look at the results. So, uh, as I look at the results, a clear uh, preference from the audience, 57% of you, almost two thirds, uh, say that the real priority is to strengthen the value chain that we have here in Europe. That's far more important than the work to strengthen the EU external actions, uh, which which got five percent, and the other uh, the other points, a minority of support for the materials, the monitoring framework, and the level playing field. So I think what we can tell from this is this is a an initiative which really needs to focus on the supply chain that Mari and Hildegard had mentioned. So in the meantime. Our initial plan had been to go right now to Peter Handley uh, for the interview uh, to get his views and to give his update on what the European Commission is achieving. But the update I've received is indeed that he is still rushing from one room to the next within the European Parliament. As a consequence, what we'll do is we'll change things up a bit. And I'd like to bring Henry Sanderson onto the screen actually to start with his view on uh, the bigger picture of this critical raw materials debate. So if the technical team could bring Henry onto the screen now. Perfect. Can you, is it okay to start now? No, I'm going to just wait for you, okay. Henry. <laughs> I'll introduce you. Henry, thanks for coming. Okay. So for Henry um, has released this year's must-read raw materials book, uh, Vault Race. He has a rich history in the Financial Times. He now works for Benchmark Minerals Intelligence. But Vault Race really gives the bigger picture of this raw materials debate. It talks quite vividly about the head start that China has and what industrial actions it's taken to deliver it such a read. So Henry, it's great to start with you here today. And you've detailed why China has such a head start. Since you've written the book, the US has taken its own big step forward with the US Inflation Reduction Act. What in your view are these two regions doing so successfully that Europe might not be yet? And what would be your recommendations for what Europe needs to do now uh, to actually catch up here? Yeah, thanks so much, Chris, and thanks for having me. I think the, the EU uh, Critical Raw Materials Act puts it well in that it is, it is a global race and it's a globally competitive market. And when you look at uh, sort of trying to, to challenge China's dominance, trying to build up Western supply chains, it, it's a lot harder than perhaps people, people think. For instance, um, certain coalitions that have been built up, such as Mineral Security Partnership, including Australia, EU and other countries, it doesn't include uh, big big producers of raw materials such as Chile and Argentina. Um, so, so that is to say that not every country is going to be willing to uh, desert China and join a, a, a Western um, coalition. So that's one thing um, to, to, to realize. Um, just in terms of, of Europe, you mentioned the, the IRA. The IRA um, is hugely important because what it does is if you want to start battery production or solar manufacturing outside of China, you have a learning curve. Um, from day one, these facilities are not going to compete with China on cost. So the difference needs to be subsidized um, by governments. And this is what the IRA does quite, quite perfectly. If you look at solar manufacturing costs, if you take the IRA into account, it is competitive with China. If you look at batteries, they're providing $45 kilowatt hour. Uh, subsidy in effect to, to make batteries um, competitive with China. Why is this so important? It's because China's had quite a head start. 
and the remarkable reductions we've seen in clean energy technologies, which are critical to enabling us to solve climate change. For the first time ever, you know, we might be able to, to, to reduce climate change because of the cost reductions in these clean energy technologies. They've, they've come in China over the last decade or more, and it's actually been quite a brutal uh, competitive uh, process. Um, but, but the West can't just produce at that cost from day one. So that's, that's critically um, important. In terms of Europe, I think we should, we should look at learning from the IRA, what it does well and, and what it doesn't. I think one of the things that people are concerned about is that it's quite extreme on, on China. Um, it looks to sort of cut China out of the supply chain from 2024. And I think my advice for Europe is, you know, I think we absolutely should diversify from China. I mean, the, I think uh, the language in the EU Critical Raw Material Act is exactly right, right? Why would we switch a dependency on oil to, to one on, on China? But I think diversifying is critical rather than China will be zero from, 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 from tomorrow. I think it's very hard to completely cut China out and it also risks increasing the costs uh, of this energy transition. And let's remember the big picture. We've got to move away from fossil fuels. We have to do it um, quickly. So we, we shouldn't cut China necessarily um, to zero. On the raw material side, I think Europe should, should improve um, the permitting for, for, for projects as long as it can still be um, environmentally uh, rigorous. I do think we have to accept that every mine does have an impact on the earth. Um, we have to come to some coherent solution of what the mine of the future looks like or what the acceptable mine looks like. And I don't think the mining industry has done a good enough job on, on, on providing us a vision of what that is. But there is no way to have a mine that is, has no impact, that has zero impact. So what are we willing to accept, right? And let's keep in mind the damage from, from fossil fuels, from, from coal mining, um, et cetera, when, when we, uh, about the, the priority of, of, of building some of these raw materials. So Europe should uh, improve the permitting if it can be uh, still, still as rigorous, um, but it should accept that we can't meet all, all demand uh, from Europe alone, right? In the best case, we could get to perhaps 380,000 tonnes a year of lithium chemicals from, you know, by 2030, but demand's going to be over 600,000. So, you know, we're probably unlikely to meet Europe's demand. So therefore, going back to what I said at the beginning, we have to go out to these other resource-rich countries to get partnerships in place to, to secure uh, supply. Because you can build lithium refineries in Europe, but if you don't have feedstock, you're kind of uh, in a difficult position. And if you don't have the raw material supply, you can't build, there's no point building battery cell uh, production if you can't get the, the raw materials. So it's critical we go out to these countries and, and try to secure um, what we can. Just two, two points on that. One is, as I mentioned earlier, not, a, not every country is uh, willing to give up China. In fact, Chile and Argentina are probably quite happy to, to supply China and they haven't joined the Mineral Security Partnership. So I don't think they're gonna turn their back on, on China for the sake of the EU. It's also a competitive um, market right now to secure raw materials. Everyone else is, is trying, trying to do it. So for me, it would be critical for this act to have something about how we uh, engage with these resource-rich countries with the acknowledgement that we can't meet all our own um, uh, raw material supply. I, I do think that, you know, Africa, um, we need to see more engagement in, in Africa. Indonesia um, is another country. The US IRA is quite prescriptive and limiting in that it encourages supply from free trade agreement countries, which doesn't include Indonesia and obviously doesn't include um, Africa. So there's no reason why we can't uh, reach out to these countries, incorporate them. That fits into the climate change agenda of developed countries helping developing countries. It doesn't necessarily need to be um, you know, all financial aid, we can also link critical minerals into that broader discussion. That would be my hope. So yeah, Chris, just those are my thoughts. Sorry, you're on mute, I think. Someone keeps muting me. Brilliant. And takeaways, yeah. we can continue on to our panel discussion. I know a few things, Henry. First, subsidies really do play a role uh, for the US, but probably also for Europe to compete at scale. Clear message, diversify, yes, but don't cut off from China. And, and you feel the US IRA is maybe too prescriptive in this front. And there is a lot Europe can do to improve permitting, yes, but resource-rich partnerships will be key. And we shouldn't yeah. be naive about the relationships China's established there. Yeah, perfect. Good summary. Thank you. <laughs> you just one, one last question is, um, I think Peter's joined us now, which is great. 
But one last question in follow up, Henry, is energy costs is something we, we, we you didn't touch yes. upon, but might be the end elephant in the room. Quite a lot cheaper in the US, subsidized in China. No. Europe is having a lot of difficulties here today. The refining stage, especially, is energy intensive. Yes. What's your view on the energy costs and how much of a bottleneck that is? I think it's a big bottleneck. I think if you look at, um, you know, a big, a big sort of open secret of this clean energy supply chain is it's very energy intensive. To have a battery gigafactory consumes enormous amount of energy. I think Northvolt in Sweden is consuming a couple of percent of the whole country's electricity. So these are huge energy intensive um, facilities. And then if you th look at things like lithium refining, it's not that you can use uh, electricity. You need natural gas in the pro process um, of, of refining the lithium. So you can replace that with hydrogen, but you need you need something uh, like that, right? So energy costs are really critical. And you're right that China for the last uh, decade, 15 years longer has had cheap coal-fired power, but it's getting more expensive in China at the same time at the moment. And within China, they're moving to areas of renewable power, you know, in Sichuan province, um, in, in areas like that. So you're exactly right. Energy is really critical. And especially if we are going to attract um, external companies, South Korean battery companies, Chinese companies, you know, what, what can we offer in terms of the energy, um, the, the subsidies, the incentives, all that factors quite a lot into the cost. So I do worry at the moment that Europe's um, energy crisis could, could delay a lot of build out of, of this clean energy supply chain. This is energy intense um, manufacturing. Brilliant, Henry. We'll take you off screen now and we'll bring Peter on and we'll come back to you, Henry, when the panel discussion starts. Peter, thanks a lot for joining us today. We're here discussing the global race. I think you've had your own race to get us uh, here. And so thanks for doing so. We shifted things a bit around in the agenda. So hopefully you heard some of the key conclusions that Henry had made just then. We also had an audience poll uh, just to give their views on, on what they see are the most important aspects of your Critical Raw Materials Act and its pillars. It might not surprise you that 60% of the audience said the work to improve the domestic supply chains for critical raw materials is the key aspect that you're working on, uh, followed by uh, the monitoring capacities and uh, the overall 2030 goals. Based on what you've heard from Henry, based on this, I mean, do you agree with this prioritization and, and what points of what you're working on in the Critical Raw Materials Act would you really like to emphasize within that? Yeah, thank you, Chris. And uh, it's nice to see Henry and uh, um, Mr. Pekka and, and uh, other panelists again. Um, look, I think it's clear from what uh, President Ursula von der Leyen has said that at, at heart, this is about building capacities in Europe. And if you read the speech that she delivered to the Bruges students uh, last Sunday, you'll see that it's about, it's about ensuring the viability and competitiveness of the European economy um, and reducing our structural strategic dependencies on the rest of the world. Because who knows if today's friend is not going to be a friend in the future. We have to take much more responsibility. So I think, yes, uh, getting our domestic capacities right throughout the value chain is the core of this. Of course, externally, we also need to do more to reduce our potential single points of failure. And that's why we have this agenda of diversifying and developing strategic partnerships, which we're, my team and I are very busy on at the moment. But um, the other key word I heard you just say was monitoring. Um, and at the heart of it, we have to know what's going on. So we are gonna be really putting into our regulation the notion of the perimeter of action, critical and strategic raw materials, and what to do about it. And it starts with monitoring, knowing how the markets are developing, early warning, stress testing, looking at risk mitigation strategies, not just in this kind of like public policy abstract way. We need to get companies to take much more responsibility for their security of supply and uh, cleaning up the supply chain. And that means taking things out of the procurement departments and putting them onto the board and making it something that they're accountable to their shareholders for. Are we diversifying sufficiently? Are we carrying enough inventory in case this just in just in just in time supply chain falls down as it's fallen down so many times in the last two years since COVID struck? So yes, I'll stop there for now. And speaking practically, Peter, the, the public consultation closed two weeks ago, I think, and there's an impact assessment going on about 
four months only until you'll be releasing your piece of legislation. What practically are your next steps to get from where you are now to the end of March? Um, so at the moment, uh, we are processing the results of the public consultation, and we're very grateful to everyone who responded. The deadline was the 25th of uh, November. We got over 500 responses and position papers, a lot of good ideas um, in there, including from Urometo, may I say. Um, and uh, we have to synthesize all that, and it forms an annex to the uh, impact assessment, and it also informs the thinking and the ideas that we're discussing at the moment so we're from the date of the state of the union announcement the 14th of september we have been working intensely with the other parts of the commission uh, and doing a lot of outreach like we're doing today uh, in order to develop deliver an impact assessment by the 19th of december it's not very much time but we have a lot of help from different parts of the commission uh, and we're confident we can make it now the next milestone is to deliver the actual regulatory package by the end of March. So we'll have a regulation, we will have an impact assessment, we will have a communication which will address things that we do not um, tackle through regulation, but are nevertheless necessary actions. And we will also have our new foresight report, which is looking at a, a wider spectrum of technologies linked to the Repower EU objectives, linked to our digital agenda, linked to our defense and aerospace uh, agenda and looking at what dependencies flow from that, because that will, if you like, sit alongside the impact assessment as another source of uh, facts and figures and, uh, and, and assessments about uh, dependencies. I don't hear you, Chris. People keep muting me. Uh, but anyway, I've got a few more questions before we bring our panelists in. Uh, just looking big picture, once you've carried out the Critical Raw Materials Act, describe what 2030 for you would look like uh, from your point of view and how will it be different to where we are today if that Critical Raw Materials Act achieves its goals? Well, I should be enjoying, enjoying my retirement, so it'll be somebody else's problem by then. But um, uh, while it's still part of my responsibilities, I'm hoping that we can really create the, the framework conditions for, for, for a material change because what we've seen over the last 12 years as we've been analyzing problems and not really taking the consequential actions is that that's the missing piece so that's that's the that's the secret ingredient of the critical raw materials act it's uh, converting the known problem into real solutions whether these are solutions about uh, uh, getting away away from depending on a single country overseas or whether it's whether it's um, uh, making sure we we really ramp up the whole refining and recycling side of things ramping up the recovery of critical raw materials from uh, mining waste and where necessary opening greenfield mines in the right uh, conditions plus building the skills and plus putting the money into research and innovation that we need to find solutions uh, around the dependencies of today's critical raw materials. And the Inflation Reduction Act, Henry was was clear about what it can what it does. It helps companies in the US build up at scale. He was also cautious about maybe it's too narrow minded and too inflexible in how it cuts off other regions. But there's now a wider debate ongoing in Brussels. The President Ursula von der Leyen gave a strong statement about a revitalized industrial policy this weekend how does that feed into your specific work on the critical raw materials act this bigger discussion around industrial policy I, i'm just um, i'm not delighted that we are in a difficult situation but i'm delighted that industrial policy is has come back into its own for what it really has to be about right it's at the heart of european policy making at the moment that combined with real security and uh, energy security i think those those three issues go together um, and uh, what the president said is very, very clear. We cannot afford to just get into a, a fist fight with our American allies. Uh, we're working so closely together on so many different issues. So we need to find the right balance between cooperation and competition. And that means, yes, we have some grievances because there are certain aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act which unnecessarily penalize like-minded countries and regions like us. So let's hope we can fix that. But we have to look to ourselves. and. Uh, she's announced that we're going to have to reopen and revisit, and rethink what it is we want to achieve through subsidies in the European uh, context. She said, for example, um, it's not enough to, to subsidize uh, 
things uh, up to the stage of a first market deployment. We're talking about rolling out whole technologies across the economy. So we need to have subsidies that support that mass industrial deployment of new technologies. But she also said state aid is great for those member states with uh, big budgets and not so great for everyone else. So it can be uh, a disruptive factor in the single market for uh, smooth functioning of the single market. Therefore, she said, we need European funds, right? We need some kind of European fund where the rules of the game don't favor the big the big boys against everybody else. And that's, that's the discussion that they're gonna have, I think, in the context of the discussion about the Inflation Reduction Act and the future sovereignty fund at the European Council later this month. We'll dive into that further in our panel discussion. We have someone from FIRA as well, maybe one of those smaller member states, resource rich, but not with the capacity of some of the other member states to fund this. So we'll be getting his views on the panel debate as well. Before we go to the panel debate, I've looked through all the consultation responses, and there's a good consensus amongst most levels of industry asking Europe to produce more of its raw materials domestically to drive forward primary projects in particular. But a lot of the civil society input is is asking that Europe is is prioritizing circular economy, using less, and and finding other ways through the bottlenecks that we face. Um, at first glance, some of these might seem incompatible. But how are you dealing and balancing these two two requests in your work going forwards? Yeah, I've had some very good uh, and very uh, constructive discussions with um, uh, civil society organisations and. Uh, political groups which are on the green side of the spectrum. And um, I think there is an emerging consensus that we really have to show European leadership on the green transition. And we, we, have, to, uh, we have to take more responsibility in balancing our consumption and our production. And what I see is uh, uh, an important argument that uh, will provide convincing uh, case to, 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 to the, those civil society organizations is, we can't just throw numbers at people saying, we are saying to you that we need 40 times more lithium or 10 times more of this. We have to really show that we've analyzed how we can possibly uh, achieve our objectives, but in a, in a less resource intensive way. So how can we, how can we suppress the, the level of demand um, to achieve our repower EU objectives of shifting to these, these green energy, uh, renewable energy technologies and electric mobility. So if we can make the case that we've really looked seriously at how we can uh, suppress demand, maximize the circularity, maximize resource efficiency throughout the whole value chain, and yet there is a delta which cannot be met except by uh, greenfield mining in Europe or outside, I think we'll... And, and that we can do so in a, in a socially responsible way. I think we'll have an easier ride in that discussion. Brilliant. That sets us up well now. I think that the, the ambitions for this Critical Raw Materials Act, the process for this Critical Raw Materials Act, should now be clear for you in the audience. So it's a perfect time to move to the panel debate stage, stage three of our discussion today. So joining me on the screen now, uh, we have a group of panelists. We've introduced Henry Sanderson already. Uh, we also have uh, Lucia Steinbach, who's project engineer for business development at Vulcan Energy Zero Carbon Lithium. Uh, we have Saku Vori, who's director at the Finland Geological Survey, GTK, and Pamela Lesser, who's the director of EU Fairs for Institute for the Initiative for Responsible Mining Assurance, or EMA but also has a rich academic background in the social license to operate for some of these projects. How we're gonna run things, we're gonna ask each speaker to, to give a three minute response to an opening question. Henry, you've already delivered yours. So I'm gonna ask Lucia, uh, Saku and Pamela for their views before bringing all panelists in for a joint discussion. Now is the time to really ask your questions as the audience, because we'll be bringing those questions up into the discussion. And I can see we already have a load of those coming through. Let's move swiftly on. Uh, Lucia, Vulcan Energy's uh, German project is aiming to bring zero carbon lithium online in Europe in the next years. Hopefully this should be a flagship of the sustainable raw materials that Peter was talking about as a priority for Europe moving forwards. Why is a project like yours so important to Europe's clean energy goals? And what do you need from the EU to help you get operational, competitive, and overcome some of the barriers other regions might not face? Lucia. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, for having me here. 
Um, so, as we all know, the European Union has set itself a very ambitious climate goal. For example, um, for the year 2030, we're looking forward to have 30 million new electric vehicles on the streets. And lithium is one of the key ingredients for electric vehicles. So, it's, it means we're going to need a lot of that in order to meet our goals. So, the global demand is rapidly rising. And Europe is running the risk of running out. And so far, we do not really have a relevant producer in, in, in Europe. And around 90% of our lithium is imported from other countries and mainly from China. And in order, so if the, this lithium flows stops, the production of batteries will stop. And hence, also the ramp up for electric vehicles will stop. And for us, it is therefore of utmost importance that we're going to make sure that we're going to, to, to use our own lithium sources that we have here in our countries. And there is plenty of that, luckily. And um, that also leads us to, to Vulcan. So when having a look at what our company does, so we, our projects are located in the Upper Rhine Valley, which is in southern Germany, southwestern Germany. Uh, in the center of the European automotive industry and the European battery industry. So like this, it leads us to short, short distances and it also it, it secures a very short supply chain. And the Upper Rhine Valley has a very large lithium resource, is one of the largest lithium uh, resources in the world. And we as Walker, we'd like to really tap into that. And already when it comes to our first stage of development, we're looking forward to supply more than 40,000 tons of lithium. And this is going to be equivalent for the production of 1 million electric vehicles per year. So in order, when we use our, to, to produce this lithium, we're going to use geothermal energy to bring the lithium containing thermal water up to the surface. And then we're going to filter the lithium out of that. And simultaneously, Whilst taking the lithium out of this firm water, we're going to generate renewable electricity and provide renewable heat at the same time. And therefore, we can make sure that our process is not only CO2 neutral, but as like really having a strict, strictly speaking, is also going to be CO2 negative. And what we are really looking forward and what we hope from the CRMA is that we're going to address two of the main challenges that we're facing at the moment. And that is on the one side, a slow and unpredictable approval, pr approval procedure for applications and also the support for the financing. But of the, the most important part for us is to really send out a, a clear signal out to the investors, the politicians and the citizens. The European Union has understood that we must take the supply of critical raw materials into our own hands. Excellent. Two key barriers there noted. So permitting and finance areas, which this act for you really need to put a focus on, Lucia. Good summarize, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I'm sure we'll pop, uh, touch on that again when we move to our other panelists. And, and Saku, maybe to move to your perspective in that front. So um, you have maybe a broader perspective than just one project. You're here looking at Finland as a whole a resource rich country which aims to develop a full supply chain from the mine to the refinery to the battery to the recycling again. Um, what do you see in Finland are the biggest hurdles uh, to achieving this integrated ambition and where can the EU support be helping? Thanks for asking an, an invitation to the panel. Uh, I could start by saying that Finland was the first country or member state that published the national uh, mineral strategy after, after a European Commission's raw materials initiative. So we have been rather active uh, uh, since since then, uh, and then uh, what, what is underpinning there is that we have a good potential in our bedrock to, to produce different kind of metals. So this this has a lot of resemblances to Australian, Southern American, uh, and, and South African, North American bedrock areas where where, where our traditional mining, uh, the places of traditional mining. So uh, there's good foundation to to, to to strive for for a stronger position in battery value chain, and uh, we made a, a national battery strategy uh, last year, or oh, it was published last year, and that was kind of a revitalization of our commitment to the support 
uh, uh, for energy transition. And um, I think in, in our nation, there's a rather wide understanding on the raw material needs that, that we are facing here. So there's a political will and, and but what we have, what is the challenge is that we need investments uh, and companies like, like Peter said. So uh, even though there's a will and, and understanding, but we need uh, investments and that's the kind of the bottleneck. And besides that, of course, we need R and D. Uh, uh, we need skilled skilled uh, labor, and and then uh, I think if if you consider the the national uh, battery strategy, there was a strong commitment to have a, a, a let's say a national uh, collaboration along the value chain. So it wouldn't be uh, sporadic or scattered projects every here and there, but there should be more strategic point of view. And that's what we are aiming to do. And I think we are we are seeing some some, some kind of success and, and 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 that's something what we are looking forward. Thanks. Excellent. So the potential is there, it's time to realize it. And if I turn to Pamela, our final panelist, you have a, a rich experience of Finland as well, I think, but today you're here primarily representing the initiative for responsible mining assurance, Emma. Your work in both fronts is focusing on improving mining standards and also the social acceptance of these projects on a local level. Do you see a risk that Europe's raw materials agenda is moving too far too fast for some of these communities? And what steps do you think are needed from the European Commission uh, to ensure that projects get accepted and supported at the local level? Thank you, Chris, very much. And thank you for the invitation. And it's really a pleasure and honor to be here. And thank you as well for introducing me with the two hats. It occurred to me that my academic hat is with the University of Lapland, which is in Rovarimi, Finland, the home of Santa Claus, and Irma may not be quite as widely known, and so if I can just take a brief amount of time to introduce Irma, um, I think it would help set the scene. So Irma, the Initiative for Responsible Mining Insurance, started in 2006, and it started in response to issues swirling around blood diamonds and around civil society distrust of industry schemes. And it was actually the jewelry industry, some of those who knew that they needed to be able to, to source more responsibly, but they had no idea where those mines were and they had no idea actually what the definition of responsible mining was. So they reached out to civil society and together decided to try to define, all right, what does responsible mining look like? In that process, others have joined. And so now Irma today, is comprised of six different sectors, which we call houses. It's locally affected communities, labor unions, civil society, the mining industry, purchasers, and investors. And from the very beginning, it was this multi-stakeholder initiative. And we also say, and are very proud of the fact that IRMA is an equal governance model. And what we mean by that is in each of those six sectors, in the board of directors, there are two seats. And if two seats in any of those sectors say no, something doesn't go forward. So you can imagine why it took 10 years actually to develop the IRMA standard for responsible mining. Consensus takes a long time to build. Now, IRMA, the standard itself, it's both a standard with 26 chapters and 400 good practice, best practice indicators. And if you compare that with TSM, it's quite robust. TSM has eight um, protocols and 30 indicators, roughly. Now, the other part of IRMA is a verification process. And this verification process occurs at the mine site, which is quite different from other standards. And there are two things that are really unique about it that no other standard has. And one is advanced public notice of audits. These are independent audits. And the second part is the audit reports are actually published on the IRMA website. So they are public and they are there for all to see. So going back to your question now, are we going too far and too fast? With the academic hat, I would say, yes, I think there is a perception, especially among local communities and among civil society, that we are going too far, too fast, and there are no proper safeguards in place. But when I was looking at what the reality is on the ground, I looked at the raw material scoreboard for 2020 and 2021, and it was saying that the mining, mining activities actually were very similar to 2018. Some mines opened, some mines closed. Uh, the one note that it made was the four, there were four lithium projects in exploration that actually became mines. So at the end of the day, there isn't a whole lot really happening on the ground in Europe. And there are a lot of reasons for that. 
I think social acceptance is one of the main ones. So I think whatever solution we come to needs to be able to build social acceptance at the beginning. We can't wait for companies to prove they're behaving responsibly for social acceptance to come out at the end. And I think we all believe at Irma, that is why industry and civil society both are asking for Irma because it builds that social acceptance in at the very beginning. So social acceptance is core to build into this initiative moving forwards and maybe in the, the debate to come we'll focus a lot discuss a bit the how what can operationally happen to to build that into some of these investment uh plans and legislative initiatives so we've heard from our panelists now we've heard from peter henry uh lucia saku and pamela uh we, we're now going to bring everyone in uh, and before we dive into specific questions would anyone like to come in on anything that they've heard from other panelists, whether it's Peter, you from the commission to give any response or, or Henry or otherwise, but uh, anyone would like to respond on anything they've heard? Uh, Pamela again, please. <laughs> Can I, I just talk with my Finnish colleague. Uh, we've never met, it's very nice to meet you. I was just wondering what your take is on the revision to the Mining Act, making exploration potentially more difficult. And also the Nature Conservation Act, those revisions, taking more of an ecosystem approach and also making exploration potentially more difficult. Thanks. Well, thanks, if I may take that one. Uh, uh, that's correct that we have a, a renewal of Mining Act ongoing and then there's plans to have a mining tax in Finland and they're in process. And, and probably it will be more stricter for the companies to operate. I guess that will be will be the end, end result. So, so I would say that uh, uh, we we need to have a swift processing uh, permitting permitting processes. Uh, uh, I wouldn't uh, say that we need to to uh, uh, what is this uh, give away the the quality and requirements of permitting, but but uh, rather ensure that there is uh, enough uh, resources to process those. Uh, let's say permits and, and the procedures what they have. So uh, and and moreover, it would be desirable to have a legal framework uh, that is on uh, kind of understandable and results are let's say predict predictable out of the processes. Maybe maybe there's a wider coherence point to discuss here as well, based on Pamela's question that. Uh, at the, the European level, like Peter, you've expressed a clear ambition, but there are other sides of policy making, environmental policies at the local level or otherwise, which sometimes can make more investments more difficult. So is there a point on coherence and, and how can this initiative help to ensure wider coherence with its environmental policies? I also see Hildegard maybe has a question, so I invite my technical team uh, to, to put Hildegard online soon, but uh, may, maybe Peter, any response on the wider coherence question first? Are you on mute? I think. Yeah, if all, all panelists all, all could be put. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. So one of the things we're working our way through in the uh, in the impact assessment is the articulation and coherence between different pieces of European legislation that already exist or have already been proposed by the Commission. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we we know from the debates in the European Parliament on on the Bentele report that there are. Uh, there are some some serious issues to work your way through on on where you can where you can do mining uh, operations in Europe, but um, um, that will be you know, assessed in in our proposal and then over to the co-legislators to 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 discuss it. But um, uh, policy coherence is is very important. The, the trouble is, European Commission is producing lots of lots of uh, regulatory proposals and uh, the cumulative. Uh, impact of all these things is not always um, uh, obvious at the beginning. So we have to really uh, face up to the fact that there needs to be much more coherence. And as my president has said, there needs to be, uh, as a default, a, a competitiveness test whenever we are regulating. But as far as our Critical Raw Materials uh, Act is concerned, it's all about the competitiveness of the European economy. So we, we want to make sure that we keep industry here in Europe, which is one of the preoccupations that my, my president has. 
Let's see, before moving to Hildegard, do you have any view on this as a company? I mean, I think in Germany, it's very split up where your rules are attributed to you. But do you have the similar coherence challenge potentially to, to what was described in Finland? When it comes to the to the regulations, well, um, we already talked about or my, my colleagues briefly mentioned the issues of the applications and also that uh, certain certain environmental aspects have to be considered when, when it comes to the realization of projects. And this is something that we are facing uh, in the realization process of our projects as well. But um, there are many applications that have to be drafted that uh, we have to consult with many um, public authorities. And it's really a, a long process. And sometimes it's not very, very clear uh, which processes along the permitting um, procedure have to be taken. And uh, so a clearer regulation when it comes to the to the permits, uh, that, that is something that would really, really help us in the in the fast development of our project. Excellent. And Hildegard, I, you may have a comment related to this or something more broadly, but as the host of the event, we definitely take the opportunity to bring you back on stage. Yeah. Uh, sorry, but it was uh, it was uh, in in my <laughs> it 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 came across a very uh, very strong side because uh, we were talking we were talking about a global race and uh, we we just said you know that United States are um, raising ahead so I was uh, surprised to hear I mean that we are going too fast currently I think we are going too slow this is what I understood and also uh, the, um, uh, what uh, our colleague from Finland said that they are doing regulation more stricter um, that's of course I think the opposite what we want I think the opposite uh, what we want is to have more projects and uh, I think we need to be faster uh, we, sh we we need to be transparent, but we have to have very clear deadlines. And I think the whole idea is to um, to permit more projects than less projects. This is w what I understood. And, and given this uh, very strong competition now from the United States, I would like to ask also Pamela. I mean, how 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 do how do Americans feel about this issue about sustainable mining? Uh, because what we see now, this is a huge. Um, uh, uh, everything is being uh, sped up and, and how do you uh, dig into this as NGO or with your standards? I mean, how do you put your fingers now in between just that we learn from it or is it does, doesn't it play a role anymore? Um, thank you, Hildegard. I feel like I have too many hats, maybe. So as an American, I'm from California, actually. So environmentally, a very progressive state. Uh, so sustainability is high on the agenda, always has been high on the agenda there. Now, that's not the case for the rest of the United States, clearly. Um, and to be honest, I think Europe has been, is now, and will continue to be in the vanguard of sustainability. I think the US looks to Europe for leadership in this area. And I think it's really crucial that Europe takes a strong stance. Now, IRMA is a standard that is about mining responsibly. It is not something that is saying you can't mine. We're just saying you need to do it to the highest, and best environmental and social standards. And I think there are market arguments as well, or business arguments, certainly, that purchasers in particular, the automotive industry, is willing to pay for that. They are demanding that. Their investors are demanding that. I think it's really important that we do do this responsibly and sustainably. And I think there will be more global demand for that. We see this proliferation of standards worldwide, whether they're commodity standards about mining, about forestry, whatever. And there's a reason for that. It's because people really want sustainable development. I think we also acknowledge that we can't impose more harm in trying to solve a problem. We are in a climate crisis. And that's what this whole thing is about. And while we need materials for renewable energies, we can't also contribute more harm at the same time. So I, I don't know if that answers, sorry. Maybe points to the crux of a, a balancing act as we move forwards. I often hear that sustainability must be Europe's differentiator in this discussion, but given the race we're in, as Hildegard said, there is a catch up to be played. The competitors not playing by the rules. How can you achieve that in a way that keeps the speed and the urgency that everyone is agreeing is necessary too? 
And I don't know if anyone else would like to, to come in on that and, and, and give their view on what that balance requires. Murray, I know you have a hand up as well, but maybe some of our panelists could come in. Henry, from your perspective, because it's been a while since your opening statement. So just, um, yes, I, I think it's interesting to learn um, Finland about this uh, amendment to the mining law that, that will come into force in March. That is um, that is interesting. I think, um, yeah, there is a fundamental conflict between wanting to, to speed up uh, the projects and then perhaps strengthening the environmental um, oversight. Um, there, are, there are problems, for instance, things like processing uh, lithium. You, you have a lot of waste, right, like sodium uh sulfate uh waste and uh you know one of the things of this green revolution is the more scale of of lithium refining etc you have too much sodium sulfate waste and the market you used to have where you could sell it to others becomes saturated um so there is an issue with these things that i think we have to grapple with which if we have more and more of these refining and processing we're going to have loads more waste products that need to be um, disposed of or we need innovations to reuse them, um, et cetera. So that's um, that's one key issue I think Europe Europe has to um, grapple with. Um, I mean, I'd love to hear more about the proposals in the EU Act to, to come up with strategic projects, right? Will these be fast tracked? Um, and what sort of process are we going to see? Because how can you how can you speed things up? The challenge in the US is a lot of the delays come from legal challenges. So any legal challenge to a mine can hold up. The, the entire process, right? So I, I don't think Europe is as litigious as that, but um, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what the plan is to speed up speed up projects. Sorry, I'm mute. Chris, sorry, you're on mute again. I'm mute again. I think I was yeah. saying that's the question for Peter. I know, Mary, you have your hand up, but but Peter, how would you respond to, to Henry's question in this wider discussion about balancing speed and responsibility? Um, yeah, we have to. Uh, just a quick one on the Finnish thing. We need to incentivize exploration. One of the things we want to put into the Critical Rural Materials Act is ask member states to be much more systematic and thorough in mapping the resources that are going to be there for the future and we don't know what's going to be strategic or critical raw materials in the future so we need the best possible all-round information about uh, about that side of thing um now as far as the strategic projects are concerned we want to make sure that strategic projects are properly assessed um against a set of criteria which will be put in the regulatory proposal um and that if they are agreed to be strategic projects and the the european parliament and the council will have a their say on the matter like they do for the energy projects of common interest then consequences should follow and one of those consequences is that the responsible authorities should make sure that it actually happens without weakening environmental and social protection but with much more efficient streamlined fit for purpose permitting processes and that includes making sure that if there are appeals those appeals are dealt with expeditiously and not used as uh, ways to kill a project um, uh, in a way that's not really uh, fair um, and the other consequence needs to be on the financial side and this again comes back to what uh, uh, President von der Leyen has said we need to make sure that there are the right kind of private national and European investment uh, support to make sure these projects actually happen and that's one of the benefits of labeling something after due process as a strategic project it should already send a good signal to the market to invest in such things where do certification schemes play in this discussion? We, we have a representative from Irma on the panel. There's a wide range of different certification schemes. Some of, I know in Finland, there's a different scheme, TSM, which is used quite widely. It's quite confusing still, but how does the European Commission look at all of these certification schemes and how they fit into your agenda? Well, this, this is very much part of the, the pillar of our proposal, which is going to be called sustainable, sustainable level playing field, right? We need to be able to have a way to demonstrate to people that things are okay and done to the right kind of standards. So we will definitely have to have some way, like we have in recent pieces of legislation, a way of talking about standard setting, um, uh, the European way, and also about how we take account of schemes that exist already and what kind of recognition of those schemes needs to take place. I'm not saying IMA is the one, it could be one of the ones, 
but uh, there may be a space for European standard setting as well. We have to wait and see, but we're analysing the options at the moment. Okay, great. And Mari, you've had your hand up for a while, so I'll bring you in. And then I also, I see Saku and Lucia, you might also want to respond on this point, but Mari, please, your view. Yes, very, 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 very shortly. We have succeeded very well in the, in the EU to create some very, very big stories like, like Green Deal and so on. But I'm not sure, not at all sure, that we have succeeded to build the story towards uh, ordinary people that they would understand that we need here also in the EU own raw materials, not only, not only uh, imported raw materials, but also we are responsible to produce or utilize our own raw materials because we have. But uh, ordinary people, they do believe that uh, these materials, uh, they come downstairs from the, from, from, from the sky and uh, then we can, can utilize them. I, I believe that uh, we should uh, create story uh, and we should uh, pay it uh, for ordinary people in the EU. It helps when it comes uh, politicians. If uh, ordinary people does not support uh, utilize, utilization of own our own raw, raw materials, uh, politicians are not uh, able already to, to, to support this kind of activities because we have in the EU still uh, quite a lot of uh, raw materials, also critical raw materials, but we don't utilize as effectively as needed. We need a story, clear story. Storytelling for the communities comes through there as well. And, and Saku, what would you like to bring? Well, uh, I would like to say a few words, words about the exploration. Uh, a couple of examples from Finland. Uh, the latest or the last major discovery uh, of green transition metals was uh, done 13 or 15 years ago. It depends on how you count the discovery. And ever since there has been an expenditure of 900 million euros for exploration. So there is ongoing work at the moment, but it's not easy to find, uh, make discoveries. So that's that's one thing, one thing that why we need to uh, uh, develop uh, exploration methodologies. We need R&D there, geophysics and so on. And, and even though it will, will still be hard. And one of the reasons is that, for instance, in, in Finland, only 3% of the bedrock is cropping out. So most of the area is in under undercover, and it's it's still a rather unexplored and, and in that sense kind of fertile ground to do the exploration. Thanks, Lucia. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, thank you. Actually, I have a comment to Henry what you said earlier. Um, well, I'd like to mention that for when it comes to lithium in Europe, there is the possibility to really do to take care of this green mining, for example, when it comes to, to Vulcan and, and our, mm -hmm. our process, we, we, do not, we, do not have, we do not have waste. We're really looking forward to filter out the lithium from the geothermal brine and then in the particles that we do not want to have, we just bring it back into solution and inject it back. So we really do have a closed circle. And I think this is something that the CRMA should take care of that, um, to make sure that the projects that are going to be realized do not compromise on the environmental aspects and also when it comes to the carbon footprint for the mining and raw material projects in, in Europe and to really, to really make sure to support innovative projects that, that make sure that we are really in line with the European aims when it comes to the European Green Deal. Yeah, to, I, to, I think to build on um, that. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I think that's a really important concept, which is when we uh, reassure these industries, we don't need to copy what's done in China, right? Exactly right. We can we can innovate um, the process to to avoid some of some of the waste issues. And I believe uh, some of the lithium refineries in the US also have have some solutions. So yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. But uh, I, I'm not sure everyone is going to do that. I don't know. But um, I agree. Green innovation is is really critical because um, we're starting from quite a blank slate in in Europe. Um, so I think that's a real opportunity. Given the apparent 
predicted scarcity of some of these metals in the next decade. We have this ambition to build up the right kind of projects here in Europe. Peter, you were clear as well that we want to, we need to diversify. Henry, you were advising going to those resource-rich countries who can deliver the metals. How, how do you balance both? You can upgrade your pro, your uh, your projects, give them the protection they need, go to where minerals are available, but maybe they're not available at the same standards. So how does that balance happen in practice? Anything to add there, Henry? So, so just be clear on, on your question, you're saying um, some of the countries are not the same standards, but do we... Um... Yeah, it was a question from the audience was, how do you balance yeah. this ambition to build up projects, secure supply we need in a way that's also meeting those standards, but maybe there's less choice on the global markets? Or... Yeah, that's exactly right. I think it's so important to remember that even if we um, do nothing, uh, you know, we, we, we buy products that are reliant on these uh, supply chains that that go through countries and for sure not all the standards will um will, will live up to to our expectations and when people talk about cobalt from from the drc and um you know artisanal mining and, and the issues there that that's all going into the supply chain it's going to china um maybe it's not in our evs but for sure we're using it in our smartphones um let's not let's not kid ourselves that we are not part of um some of the issues um, in this supply chain in, in other countries. The good thing about an EV is it's a green product, so people um, expect um, better standards, but we're all completely complicit um, in, in a lot of the, the issues in these supply chains. So, so I think that the issue for me is that if we don't want mining in Europe and we, we don't want mining in the US, then we must go to these countries and help and, and in, try to improve what is going on um, in, in these countries and, and try to really... Um, recognize uh, some of the the problems and be transparent about it and i do think we shouldn't make um the perfect the enemy of the good and i, I think uh, there's probably not going to be a absolute perfect um artisanal cobalt mine in the drc but we should we should um support improvements and we should um you know be willing to to help with improvements so i think it's it's that's a really important point i think in my mind that um as i said in my opening climate change caused by the rich world, uh, developing countries that suffer, why not make critical minerals part of some of the assistance that we provide to developing countries? Right now in Indonesia, Chinese are investing in all the nickel, which is hugely polluting. And the West is talking about giving 20 billion to Indonesia to, to clean up its coal-fired power. Um, so why aren't we involving critical minerals in the discussion there? That, that's, that's sort of interesting for me. Lucia, you wanted to come in here and uh, Pamela afterwards. Thank you. I just wanted to add that, um, first of all, before we make the, the decision or before people can make the, de the decision where to buy the raw materials from, we really have to make them, um, so they are the ones making the choice what kind of raw materials they buy. But first of all, we have to offer them a choice. And this is again where the EU comes into play. So they have to, um, with the CRMA, provide companies with the incentives to to realize their project and then at the end um, give companies or give people the incentive to to buy the locally produced raw materials as far as possible and then simultaneously at the same time to support the development of domestic uh, raw material production and like this this will this will just ensure that we're going to have a, um, a robust a healthy um, strong supply chain and uh, this along the um yeah this this would just help us for for the entire production amela from your side thanks chris um picking up on what henry said um, really interesting comments henry i agree that i think the wealthy countries have used a disproportionate amount of the world's resources and it's important not to continue exporting harms for mining to other places i mean everywhere in the world there should be good laws that protect the environment and people on the point of Indonesia, though, it's interesting because the Indonesian government did invite Irma to come. It was a couple of months ago and to make presentations. And there's a lot of interest in actually on the government's part is trying to improve how mining is done there. Where that goes, I'm not sure, but just wanted to say that it's been interesting to see Indonesia's reaction. And, and Peter, the diplomacy to the Commission of Deliver driven by necessity but as henry says has to deliver benefits too what's what's your reaction here well i think we uh 
we can differentiate ourselves when we go and talk to uh, developing countries in Africa and Latin America, because it's precisely because we we uh, we are partners who want to help those countries raise their performance and keep more value in the economy that we are different from um, the classic uh, extractive uh, approach that you may get from um, ooh, I'm going to name anybody um, or there are, there are, there are, uh, we're different so it's it's we can we can also be more realistic in terms of saying we don't expect you to really it's the European uh, level of performance in one in one leap will help you in the process. So I think we have to go in with a value proposition which is is of that kind. It reflects European values, but it also reflects our own enlightened self-interest because we want to have clean stuff coming into our single market, and that's one way to ensure that. To talk more broadly on the supply chain, we, we talk a lot about mining here. Um, Peter, maybe following up, your commission has been very clear that refining, the refining stage of the supply chain is an area where Europe can also differentiate itself. We're not so bound by the geological resources. Um, we'll need to get minerals, ideally domestically and abroad together. But what do you see as the main challenges for building up the refining stage of the supply chain too? Yeah, well, if you go back to um, the commission president's State of the Union speech, that was one of the first things she said, when we're building capacities, we have to look at the refining. It's the, it's the core middle part. You know, it may be in future that we are able to do more about sourcing uh, materials, primary materials from under the ground or secondary materials from the economy or from uh, mining waste. But essentially, even if we're importing stuff, we need to do much more to build up our ability to process and refine in a clean way. And I've looked at some of the numbers let's say look at graphite production or or magnesium production or whatever it may be you can actually quantify how much carbon footprint goes into some, something made in made in china in a coal based uh, energy mix um, with doing it here uh, let's say look at the the nordic region where you've got lots of hydro or other regions where you have lots of solar and wind to do the to do the processes with we can really make a difference in terms of the the, the carbon footprint and the lower environmental emissions that go with something. And that has a market value. I think end customers and the downstream manufacturers increasingly are looking for that kind of thing. So one of the options that we are examining, and I don't say it's going to be in the final proposal, is does it make sense to have some kind of carbon footprinting so that there's, a, there's an ability to, cho to choose your supplier based on the information available? I know it. A lot of support from the industrial side for the work on battery passport in this area. It seems like this maybe expands on that. I've also seen some stakeholders uh, calling for targets in this area. I know the NGO transport and environment suggested for lithium, for example, we should ensure 50% of our needs in 2030 come from domestic refineries. Do you look at that too, Peter? We are indeed looking at the question of target setting. Um, uh, my commissioner has already spoken about, you know, we should be not trying to become totally self-sufficient, but to increase the proportion which we do ourselves. It's, 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 a, it's an insurance policy and it increases our leverage uh, in negotiations with other parts of the world. So there will definitely be some, uh, uh, some target setting. Precisely what we'll set targets on is still to be determined. Saku, I see you want to come in here and then Hildegard as well again too. So if she could be put back on the screen while Saku, uh, you give your remarks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, just one comment on the energy costs and, and, and mentioned that it's critical. I mean, we have a lot of refi metal refining here in, in Finland and I know those guys are hurting at the moment. So how much we are able to produce low carbon footprint metals in the future. That's one of the things. And another thing was I, I would like to mention is that the total amount of extraction. So if we are able to do this green transition, so hopefully the oil, gas and, and coal extraction will be diminished. Uh, so and, and the metals that are replacing them are, are recyclable. So I think we just have to make this trade off and hopefully there's less less uh, in global level extraction. Thanks. Hildegard. I would like to come back to the question of price and, and finance. 
um, as much as I want to believe that uh, consumers are putting more emphasis on, on sustainability, but if you know now that uh, electric vehicles are a lot more expensive than the combustion engines, and uh, if you also see that the Chinese competition in this regard is pretty, pretty tough, um, is, is, is this calculation going off? Uh, if we say this sustainability will be paid by the consumers and it is, it is worth it. Um, that, that's my question. I mean, is this part of the impact assessment? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would like to believe it. And I would like to believe that consumers uh, pay attention to this. Um, maybe it's also not such a big margins at the end. If you look into an uh, electric vehicle, maybe it's a very small margin then. Uh, if you used uh, uh, sustainably sourced resources or not, that, that, that would be very interesting for me. But what kind of percent, percentage do we talk about? And also the, the, the question of energy costs. I think we have really a, a huge problem now because we have not yet a solution to, um, to bring down energy costs. And this is also a huge competition factor I think, with regard to the US and to China. And for quite a, um, a mid or long-term perspective, we have not just not yet solutions there. We're currently buying very expensive LNG gas. We might build new nuclear power plants, which are also very expensive if we start them building. So um, on a mid and long term basis, our energy costs uh, in the EU, if you look at the value chain, the refining capacities, as you said, um, are there options like uh, the Vulcan uh, uh, experience, which is very, I mean, well situated, which is in every regard also uh, when I was there we talked much more about renewable energy project than about a raw material project because it has this aspect but is this can this be copied to other regions or to other projects so we talk uh, about energy costs as a barrier in europe and and others too there's a question from the audience to bring in and, and they're concerned that in this scaling up phase europe will be quite vulnerable in certain commodities particularly there's a chance that china could flood the market with cut price the the, the, men, the example mentioned was for rare earths it's about 20 to 30 percent more expensive to be making the rare earths here in Europe compared to China. And how can we safeguard our sectors as they're growing to scale, as Henry mentioned, and, and how far does that get taken into account? So, Peter, I guess we go here first for you, because there's a load of points there in terms of pricing in the desire for sustainably sourced metals and minerals, um, safeguarding against perceived dumping, dealing with energy costs. This goes a lot bigger than just what one piece of legislation can tackle, probably. But how do you bring it into your assessment? Yeah, well, I think I think uh, we're, we're dreaming of thinking we can have a great refining sector in the future unless we can fix the energy the energy problem, and that's where the uh, the energy market reform comes in, and all these questions about caps and decoupling gas. So, you know, this is the burning issue at the moment. Um, but let's let's assume that uh, we we can solve that, and at some point, you know, Russia is is no longer. Uh, being a brutal invader in Ukraine is today, then we're going to get to some kind of normality. But that normality is probably still going to be what it always was, which is our energy costs remain higher than some of our competitors, right? So we have to find a way to 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 compensate for that. Um, and one way is the sustainability proposition. I I, I agree, Miss Bentler. Will the end consumer be prepared to pay a lot more for things? It depends. How much it translates into. I mean, we did the calculation for green steel. It doesn't add more than like 50 euros to the price of a car because there's so many other things going in there. So who knows? Um, but I, I think one of the issues that we, we are very much aware of uh, is we need flanking measures for our Critical Raw Materials Act. We need a very uh, robust and proactive trade policy, um, both in terms of our offensive needs, in terms of securing resources from other parts of the world and making sure that the, the trade and investment regime remains open, um, but also domestically to make sure that um, we jump on potential uh, market um, abuse measures by dominant players much quicker than we do today. Uh, and that we, we make use of provisions which do exist in our, in our rule book and which are entirely consistent with WTO rules to um, protect nascent industries from being killed by unfair competition. Henry, just from a global, oh, sorry, Pamela, I see you've got a hand too, but I'll go to Henry first. And from your global perspective, 
what do you see in the next decade? We're going to have these sort of battles uh, for for raw materials dominance. Like, is Europe going to be at risk with some of the things you're hearing? Yeah, I think the biggest risk um, actually is that the China will, um, you know, cheaper Chinese EVs, right? Because they have um, access to um, this supply chain that uh, the Western automakers won't. Um, they have access to the nickel in Indonesia or um, you know, other, other you mentioned, you know, rare earth uh, magnets. I think that's um, that's probably the strategy of, of China, which is to produce um, cheaper and you know they hope better electric vehicles and export them into Europe. Um, and that's or, that's already happening. Um, they're also because they produce so many batteries. The latest battery technologies often go to the Chinese EV startups rather than to um, Volkswagen or, or other companies. So. I, I don't necessarily think, I don't know if China in terms of raw materials would, would swamp the market, but um, I think they can produce these cheap, cheaper uh, clean energy uh, technologies, which is why I said at the beginning, like um, we have to support uh, the manufacturing in, in Europe um, initially in the initial stages, because it will be higher costs, right? That's why we have to have um, subsidy. You know, once you get going on the learning curve, costs will come down, but initially, um, it, it would be higher. So, so that's um, that's one of the issues. I would just say though that um, in terms of the Europe's power, um, one thing to me is incredibly powerful what standards Europe sets because this impacts the whole supply chain and the Chinese players now are very concerned about which way Europe is gonna go in terms of you know, carbon border adjustment, in terms of battery passport, battery standards, um, and they will make those changes. So if Europe sets uh, tough standards, Chinese players, throughout the whole supply chain down to Indonesia and down to uh, the resource extraction will meet those uh, standards. So it's an incredibly effective way of creating change in the supply chain um, in, in that sense. And we had a, a comment or a question in the audience um, asking, we always talk about this as a mining issue, but this is a supply wow. chain issue. It's a technology issue. And, and Henry, you're quite clear there that it's the technologies and the supply chains which China's building up. It's not just the metals. Uh, Pamela, you, you wanted to come in a while ago. So um, maybe how would you respond there? Uh, thanks, Chris. Um, and thank you, Henry. I, I think we should hire you at Irma. Um, <laughs> but I just wanted to make the point uh, also regarding EVs that BMW, Mercedes, Ford, GM, Volkswagen, and Tesla are all asking for improvements from the suppliers. And they're using Irma to increase uh, their information and to keep pressing for more and more improvements. So they want to have higher due diligence requirements. They don't seem to be saying sustainability is too expensive. If anything, it's the reverse. We see them pressing for more. So at least from the Irma perspective, yeah. Do you see that the US Minerals Partnership, for example, is, is bringing groups of Western countries together? Is this an opportunity to build some sort of shared standards, shared markets to, Henry, increase that collective power you were speaking about? Peter, you've got a hand here. Yeah, because I'm actually the uh, the uh, EU representative in the Mineral Security Partnership. So um, it's quite interesting because it brings together the US, Japan, the EU, uh, the UK, uh, who else? Um, South Korea, um, and there's four EU member states there. And the, the idea is to um, make sure we don't kill each other in, in going for these resources uh, around the world. Um, so we've all pitched in with projects which we think would benefit from a cooperative approach, uh, risk sharing, benefit sharing. But it's very interesting that one of the value propositions of the Mineral Security Partnership is um, to go for high high levels of environmental, social, and governance. And we're working on a on a paper on a on a common position paper about this at the moment. And there's already been a very good conversation during UN General Assembly with a wide range of the resource-rich countries who are were very receptive to this approach um, because you put yourself in the position of let's say South Africa it's got it's got the Japanese the Americans the British the Europeans uh, and others coming in and you know it needs some way to kind of reconcile all these competing interests now you can just go in and grease the right palms if, if you're if you're if you're so inclined but if you're not if you really want to have clean and transparent supply chains you want to go about this in a much more um, responsible way and that's what we as europeans want to do and we think there's a degree of common ground uh, in in working alongside uh, 
yeah, people like the Canadians and the Americans and, and Japanese and others. Would anyone else like to come in on that? Otherwise, looking at our questions, uh, we've got about 10 minutes left, by the way, for this discussion, and then we'll go to our MEPs to, to close things up. But um, our panelists, uh, our questions in the audience, there's a lot focused on recycling. Obviously, we're focused here in this discussion so far on the urgent need to bring primary materials into the system in the right way. At the same time, make sure that the circular economy is going to work in, in practice. So some questions about how that arm of, of the Critical Raw Materials Act will work. Also noting that this too is a very competitive market. We've been discussing competition on primary supply, but China, Asia, they've, they've built up, they've got big scrap pools themselves. They want our scrap. What can we as Europe do to ensure that this is also a source of our raw materials moving forwards and, and where are the risks? Would anyone like to come in on the recycling side of things? Peter, I go to you in terms of silence because I know, oh no, Saku, you've got a hand here, Saku. Well, just a brief comment that the recycling, it's, it's not easy <laughs> as well. So uh, I think there was one guy who said that it's, for instance, considered coffee, it's easy to pour in milk and, and sugar, it's easy, but if you want, want to reverse that, it's 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 not so easy. So so uh, circular design is, is one thing to address. So when you when you design your product, so you need to be recyclable. Uh, but uh, I think even though there is a good, uh, let's say momentum in, in R&D and, and so on in recycling, so it, it just can meet the demand on later on. So it's it's not, silver bullet at the moment. So you need to address that one, but you still need some, some other measures. Thanks. One of the questions pointed to the issue of black mass, the intermediary and the battery recycling, that, that this is the resource that people want and it's quite easy to ship it out of Europe currently. And some operators from elsewhere are trying hard to get, get access to that. Maybe Henry, just a broad perspective, what's your view on the recycling market here in Europe's place in it? And is this leakage a challenge and a risk? And then I can go to Peter afterwards. Yeah, it really is. You know, you need to. Europe needs to to better keep. Um, you know, waste is the is the wrong way probably to look at it, right? It's a critical resource, right? It needs to keep it within its borders uh, rather than being uh, leaked out of its borders. I would just agree with the earlier point that recycling is going to play a really key role um, from twenty thirty onwards, um, twenty thirty five. Um, you know, as you as you start to get towards mid century, recycling could be could be really important and we could you know we could reach um really high rates like aluminium uh and now you know like lead acid batteries so that's the hope right um when we talk about this raw material challenge in a way it's it's this decade when you have this exponential demand increase um then that's why why we need mining because we need to meet this uh demand increase to solve climate change right so recycling uh contribution probably won't play a big part this decade, um, because A, we don't have all the uh, batteries coming back. Um, if you have an EV, you know that lithium ion battery is an amazing technology and will last 15 years um, or more. Most people don't drive uh, far at all. In fact, we have all these resources sitting in, in their driveway most of the time. Um, so it's going to take a while for, for those materials um, to come back. But what recycling is going to be key for is um, all the waste that comes out of manufacturing. We have all these gigafactories sprouting up. I talked about the learning curve earlier, but you don't just open a gigafactory with, with new staff, with new people and produce 100% efficiency in your first year of production, in fact, much less. So we're talking tons and tons of waste rejects and, and, and things like that that can be uh, recycled, that can help with um, you know, the circular uh, economy and then things like crashes and, and other other waste um, materials so yeah collection and uh, setting up these systems is is really key but I don't think recycling is a panacea uh, this decade. Peter to what extent can you tackle this in, in the Raw Materials Act versus the waste legislation that's developed and in place? Well we're having that discussion with our environmental colleagues at the moment to see what we could usefully drop into the Critical Raw Materials Act. It comes back to the, the target setting issue at what points in the in the value chain. Um, but as Henry's just said, we don't have to wait for the future fleet of electric vehicles in Europe to come to the end of life. There's so much stuff being produced uh, for certification purposes and the usual kind of process waste. 
and there's already black mass. Now, if we uh, if we are negligent, we will allow all this black mass to disappear off to China, and we'll never have a proper closed loop of of of, of keeping the stuff in the, in uh, of value in the economy. So we need to make sure that we already start to develop the right uh, business models to uh, design, recover, and recycle this stuff. And that's where the battery regulation, I think, is quite powerful um, in, in creating the, the framework conditions for a, for a viable European battery value chain. So i just I just add um, one final point on that, which is uh, we haven't talked about it, but the average um, battery size that people are going to have in their cars makes a big difference to raw material uh, demand. So are we going to drive uh, you know, massive grade cars or smaller cars? You can eliminate the lithium deficit by driving uh, smaller cars with smaller batteries. So that's when we talk about all these issues, that's also really, really key to keep in mind. Has Chris, um, Chris disappeared then? No, no, I'm here. I keep being muted. Right. I was just gonna say, does anyone else wanna come in on this last point of using less in a sensible way? I thought Pamela was maybe looking to get involved, so I went to her. <laughs> no, I wasn't. Sorry, Chris. Um, I have to say, Irma is is focusing more and more on recycling and and the whole supply chain. We are coming up with other standards, but no, I don't have a comment on on that. No problem. Well, looking at the time, we'll move to the wrap up phase of the panel discussion. I mean, we've covered a lot of different grounds. The global race has been clear in the discussion. The urgency of action is also clear. And within that, there seems to be a balance to attention or a balance to get right between where, how we support our local supply chains and grow them and all of the materials we need from elsewhere and how we keep a level playing field. And some tensions came out in the discussion, maybe not all the resolutions, but clear from the statements of Peter that they have this view in mind. And the impossible task of trying to make ensure coherence with all of these elements is something, Peter, you carry forwards now for uh, for the next weeks and months. What we'd like to do um, just to close the discussion is to go to each of their panelists to give their one minute wrap up statement to look forward of everything that we've heard and discussed today. What would be your top priority or top two or three priorities that you would bring out and give that message back to Peter? This is what the Critical Raw Materials Act needs to deliver in March to give us confidence that we'll reach that vision of 2030. So we'll go through all the speakers and then we'll end up with Peter. So Henry, from your side. Uh, sorry, I'm mute. Yes, uh, my two things, uh, you know, clear, uh, optimized permitting processes um, would, would, would be interesting to see. Um, just a second thing, you know, perhaps grants available similar to the US uh, Department of Energy funding, um, that, that would also be, be great to see as well. Thanks. Brilliant. Lucia. Thank you. Um, for us, it's important um, that the role is recognized, um, this, the CRMA play, plays in, in reaching both the goals for the, cli the climate goals and also in strengthening the European industry. And it is important to send out a very clear signal to both people inside the European Union and also outside that we will that things will be done, whatever it takes to that, that is that is needed in order to to utilize those raw material sources that we have. And um, this signal must not only just stop at the EU level, but it also has to to penetrate down to the municipal level that um, projects will not, or to make sure that those projects do not fail um, due to the resistance of local populations. So public awareness is also something that should be addressed. And um, everyone in Europe must understand why the secure supply for critical raw materials is so crucial for us. For, for us. And in addition, um, yeah, the CRMA should also bring tangible improvements for projects. So in particular, just to repeat you, Henry, what you said is speeding up the approval procedures and also to support for financing. Thank so you. Tangible improvements to projects, it seems we've discussed solutions, the problem of the local acceptance. We've talked a bit about certification, but not necessarily yet reached the golden answer for how we bring that online. But Saka, what would your takeaways be? Well, I, I will be very short, but there's three points, investments, investments, and investments. 
<laughs> Short, sweet, memorable. Pamela, for you. I think I have three different points. So I would say that <laughs> Europe continues its leadership in setting high environmental and social standards, that the CRM Act aligns with other legislation, and that IRMA is able to reflect the fact that both civil society and industry are asking for more than legal compliance minimums. Perfect. And Peter, over for you, maybe not your top priorities because you're working on the whole piece, but what would your key takeaways be from those uh, four closing statements that you'll take on board? Look, it's all, it's all, it's all, it's all very coherent messages. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm in re rece reception mode at the moment rather than giving my own wish list. My wish list is to get to the uh, end, <laughs> end point and deliver this uh, proposal on time and make sure it's a good proposal. That's very clear and practical, and we all support it as well, I think. Well, a, a warm thank you to all of our uh, five panellists for joining this debate today. Again, a lot of ground covered. It's clear the scale of the challenge Europe has ahead of us. It's encouraging, as Peter says, the coherence of what we're responding to, and we remain to be seen whether we have the firepower, the policy legislative tools which will deliver that. But we're all excited to march, and, and good luck to Peter for taking that work forwards. We'll close this panel now, and then we'll move forward to the, the last stage of this discussion, which is to bring back Hildegard and Mari, our two haste MEPs, who will close us out with their reflections. So Hildegard, Mari, if you could join the screen again, I just have a few questions for you uh, before we close this event. So hopefully they'll be on screen shortly. Hildegard, I can see. Hi, Hildegard, and Hi. Mari to come. In the meantime, Hildegard, what would your main takeaways be from today's panel? Well, um, as I know quite uh, almost all of the panelists, and uh, this is, I think, also Peter's feeling, we had a, we have a lot of coherence, and I'm clearing out my last doubts with regard to Pamela. We met for the second time, and I always try to be a little provocative, but uh, she gives very good answers. I'm actually on this issue what Murray said we need a narrative because we do not have member states here at the table unfortunately because they are in the permitting procedures the eu cannot do so much about this we can appeal and i think this is what lucia also is concerned about the local level the regional level the nation national level and to to get across this narrative and this story that this is very fundamental industrial policy and I think maybe this is our task as representatives uh, to spread this message and to create this narrative. I think this is, comes also back to the Green Deal, Peter. I think we have to tell the story much better because I have the feeling, and this is why I'm, I'm a representative, I have the feeling sometimes, this is why I was a bit provocative, that people lose the faith that we can solve this problem, that others are overtaking us, that everything is too cost intensive. And we, I think we have to... You know, we have to again tell the story of the Green Deal, which I like from the very beginning from Ursula von der Leyen, but we have to now implement it and realize it and, and bring this new projects, new skills and new jobs. And then I think people uh, will be very happy to be part of this story. Mari, from your side, your key takeaways. Yes, I think that in public debate, we have the opportunity to hear many times that recycling, 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 it is answers to, to many, many, many issues. Also in this field, we have now had, uh, had these conversations, but, and I believe that um, recycle is really important, but, but, but then I underlined also after this uh, debate we have had here that uh, we should also encourage our own mining sector in the in the EU, helping in permit permit processes and and uh, being much more connections with ordinary people uh, so that they understand that we really need raw materials and critical raw materials and that we also have our own own responsibilities to utilize our own resources. With these words. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And just uh, you're both put a focus on encouraging local supply, but a real strong message about the narrative, the story and and the communities. You're the elected officials in the EU institutions. So I guess the European Parliament has a key role to play here when it comes on, on your desk. H how do you think you're going to add value to what the European Commission is doing from a European Parliament perspective? Maybe Hildegard, to start with you again. 
Well, I mean, I'm there not to give more regulation on a regulation. So this is why we're having all these conversations. I'm hoping for a perfect proposal from the European Commission, which doesn't need so much improvement anymore, <laughs> that we have it very fast, because this is in our interest, that we have it in this term. Um, so um, we invested so much <laughs> in discussions and, and bring in, have a very broad discussion. And uh, I think that, that was a perfect process. And I understood much more coherence and a much broader uh, um, participation than uh, like one and a half years ago when we did our report. Mario, you would echo that for me? I agree. I agree with Hildegard. Thank you. What, what will be the most, what do you think is the biggest challenge going to be in the parliament? What are the issues that will be more challenging than others of everything we've discussed to gain consensus on? I, I think that uh, it's uh, maybe difficult to uh, do, uh, how can I say, to understand that, like I many times have emphasized here that uh, we really need also our own production when it comes mining sector and, uh, and because uh, we try to protect much more intensively our 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 earth and uh, and so uh, i think that these are uh, let me say the benefits between recycling and new mining processes uh, that might be the most important um, focus is uh, during our 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 conversation. Hildegard, particular challenges you it's expect from this? Final, the final thing. If you provoke me so much, of course, <laughs> our biggest risk are the bans. If we come up with bans again, and this was part of the discussion in the past, if we come up with bans, if you prohibit things instead of enabling them then we ha do not have such a good discussion. But I also hope that we moved uh, ahead and that we do it, we can persuade everybody that we want to do it together in a responsible way, um, but that we have to also balance things. And I think we can learn a lot from the renewable energy discussion, which we are currently having, because we want to massively expand renewable energies. And also there were some you know, discussions moving forward uh, with regard to bans, not have bans, but to have to go to areas and so on. So I hope also with regard to the fast permitting, this is also we were very much targeting with renewable energies. And I hope that we have all learned our lesson from this. I mean, in the last years, it's crazy your report was only written a year ago or so because the whole world has changed so dramatically and the level of interest in this topic has accelerated too. So completely different picture when it comes back on your desks. Just the last question before we close. This is a, it's organized by two groups as well. It's by the EPP group, the Renew group, your two leaders on the file. So I mean, what work do you already do to set the groundwork here to, to ensure that, I mean, part of this is this event, but what are your plans going forward to ensure that all of that is organized well by the time the file hits your desk? Between yourselves. <laughs> As you see, we are well organized, but we are, of course, reaching out to our colleagues, but you see also that there's uh, in some groups there's more interest in some groups there's less interest so I <laughs> this is where I would like to leave it <laughs> maybe you have maybe you have recognized that uh, in the Parliament we have uh, many colleagues who also have been very 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 interested in in organizing this kind of event just where the focus is somehow uh, in uh, critical raw materials and it's very big and very positive issue. I'm muted again. Hildegard Murray, thanks again from uh, myself, but everyone who's on the line. We have 550 registered participants, which is showing the level of interest in this debate, even as you said, Murray, with so many other discussions happening on critical raw materials currently. It's been a rich discussion, uh, a rich two hours. We've outlined areas of consensus, areas of friction, and I think we're all excited for the months ahead. And we'll see you both again, I guess, in March and April when this file does come on your desk formally. So thanks again. Thanks to our panelists and a warm Christmas break to all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank see you, you in Brussels. Thanks.
Yes. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.